Bene, siamo qua nella sede della Società Cicloneti Italiana, di Apano, 48, e siamo felici di poter ospitare Mariano Dolzinger Boleber, che è una figura di grande spicco nella ricerca psicoanalitica, nell'ambito della ricerca psicoanalitica. Ve la presento anche se per certi aspetti non avrebbe bisogno di presentazione. Mariano Dolzinger Boleber è analista di training e supervising and training analyst della società tedesca di psicoanalisi e anche membro, former member della società svizzera di psicoanalisi, ha rivestito per l'IPA tantissimi incarichi all'interno dei comitati di ricerca e in particolare per quel che riguarda appunto la ricerca clinica. Ha ricevuto anche due premi molto importanti nella nostra disciplina. Nel 2016 infatti ha ricevuto come riconoscimento al suo enorme impegno nella psicoanalisi il Mavi Sigone Award e recentemente ha ricevuto un altro premio da parte della società psicoanalitica di San Francisco, un riconoscimento specifico sulla, per aver implementato la ricerca in psicoanalisi, l'Askel Prize, se non sbaglio. Siamo qui per fare alcune per esplorare alcune domande più generali sull'ambito della ricerca in psicoanalisi. E comincerei, visto che è da molto tempo che Maria Lorenzegher è impegnata nel campo della ricerca, da qual è stata la spinta che l'ha portata a impegnarsi nell'ambito della ricerca psicoanalitica? Quali sono stati i tuoi interessi personali che ti hanno condotto verso questa sfera della psicoanalisi. Yeah. Well, as a psychoanalyst, of course, answering your question, you always have very personal motivation, and I will not go into details there, but I want to mention it, and I think of two other lines. Uh, when I was studying medicine in my uh, 22nd year of life, my sister was dying under quite traumatic circumstances. And I had an adolescent breakdown afterwards and I was very lucky that I found a very good psychoanalyst. And my psychoanalytic um, therapy at that time, or it was a psychoanalysis, it was a high frequent psychoanalysis, was such a personal liberation, which was of course connected with a very basic existential experience of finding out what brought me into this. Uh, pathological mourning process. It had on a more general level, I'm coming from a family of theologists and um, well, other kind of uh, disciplines, but theology played a very a big role in our family and it didn't help me to come out of this crisis, but psychoanalysis did. So that was another line which brought me into um, a very early interest, which even had started before in my high school, when I was very curious about the epistemological problems of how to get knowledge, how to, you, uh, knowledge can help you understand yourself, but also the others can understand the human mind, and uh, of course in the field of medicine or psychology. I think the third line was also that, you know, uh, um, At that time, the student revolution was even arriving in Switzerland. Three years later than in Frankfurt, you know, it was in 1971. Uh, mm -hmm. We had big uh, uh, protests of students and I was involved in that. And that was a time where psychoanalysis was in the middle of social interests. And it was a social libera liberation movement in a very broad sense. And uh, of course the most brilliant students, they were interested in psychoanalysis. And uh, for me, uh, this was at the university a very thrilling time. I was, uh, the, I was assistant in the clinical psychology department afterwards. And I had, my head was uh, a psychoanalyst, Ulrich Moser. And he was a very brilliant man, but also a very, uh, uh, how can I say that in English? You know, he was not a conformist. Mm -hmm. He had his own opinion and he had 
uh, he gave us some some resistance, and we had to fight with him and to find our position. And he, he hated idealizations. Idealization were for him just the defense. So he he uh, kind of motivated us to get into um, dialogues, conflictual dialogues on very central issues, on clinical psychology, but also on psychoanalysis and on research topics. At this time already, the, the, the controversial uh, discussion with different schools in psychoanalysis started. Uh, not psychoanalysis, but psychology started, you know, the cognitive behavioral started to become more and more popular. And therefore, uh, we started to be uh, concerned about how you can study. And so it was just a richness of understanding of psychoanalysis from a clinical point of view, from a technical point of view, but also from an epistemological point of view. And for me, you know, coming from this kind of, uh, coming from a mountainous valley, which was very narrow, psychoanalysis was like this. So I didn't want to, to, to be in a church again, you know, I wanted to be in a Wissenschaft, in a, in a, a world of curiosity, of investigation. It was, a, it was also a passion to investigate the most crazy and irrational uh, phenomena of the human mind. You know, we were also in, in Switzerland, we, at that time we were very much uh, uh, yeah, discussing or trying to understand the Holocaust and National Socialism. That was at that time a big issue. So, I mean, these were the three lights, a very personal one, but I think my academic career, I was lucky to have uh, teachers. I also must study German literature, which I just love, you know, and, uh, and beside medicine and psychology. So, and then this, this psychoanalytical world. At, mm. time, at that time, we had a split of the group afterwards, which was a very sad institutional experience for me. But before, when I made my training, it was just a richness and curiosity and wanted to get to understand human mind was such a passion for all of us. And I was very lucky. And I think some of this feeling, the basic feeling that psychoanalysis still is, even if the times have changed so, so much, but it's still just a absolute a, a, a privilege which mm. we have to offer in that. I mean, I, I'm still very gracious to Sigmund Freud and what he, he gave us, but I think as a scientific movement, of course, in the last hundred years, we have learned a lot of things since Freud, and I think he, he wouldn't have liked us only to idealize him. For me, he, his basic attitude was that of a researcher, of curiosity. We will talk about that. And I think he wants us to take this, uh, this spirit of curiosity, of not knowing, of trying to understand the complexity of the human mind by different perspectives, different methods. I think he would like us to do that and not to build a church again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ecco, mi sembra che in questo senso ci hai spiegato molto bene come eh, appunto la tua spinta nasca da la tua spinta verso la ricerca nasca dalla miscelarsi di queste complesse ragioni e le hai identificate molto bene, però questo mi fa andare avanti e chiederti una cosa. Secondo te ci sono delle ragioni specifiche per cui certe culture, come per esempio quella di cui tu, che tu hai trovato in Germania, sono più aperte all'idea della ricerca empirica rispetto ad altre culture, ma non solo in senso psicoanalitico, proprio da un punto di vista delle loro radici. Perché mi sembra che tu hai trovato un humus in quel momento storico particolarmente fertile alla nascita di un processo di pensiero verso, aperto verso la ricerca empirica. The Anglo-Saxon and the, the, the psychoanalysis in the States, they were much more um, integrated in medicine and also in kind of a, we would say, positivistic 
kind of understanding of science, science and wissenschaft. This is science is more or less a natural sciences. And in, in, in my biography in Switzerland and in Germany at that time, we had a very different understanding, which was influenced also by the student revolts. Psychoanalysis was for us a social movement of liberation, of enlightenment, a, a critical hermeneutic movement, which wanted to understand the darkness of the human mind. And of course, we were very skeptical against empirical research because we thought we will have, don't have the methods to with natural science methods to investigate these unconscious uh, conflicts and fantasies. So a long time, um, critical hermeneutics was the mainstream of psychoanalytic research in Germany and in Switzerland too. And I had this tension because my, my head of my department, you know, he, he, he wanted us to do empirical research also. He forced us. So we had kind of a detention. We want, you know, I was very much fascinated and identified with psychoanalysis. So I had to, I had to either I would try to uh, do my research job at the university with research questions that had something to do with psychoanalysis. And then that was very challenging. And of course, for my left friends, I was a bit betrayal, it was a betrayal to psychoanalysis to try to investigate empirically. But on the other hand, I just would have had to make cognitive behavioral research and didn't want that. So I tried to, to kind of uh, make a bridge of what I loved, I was identified with psychoanalysis, to empirical research. And uh, I found bridges for my feeling, you know, and to make it a bit more concrete, my first training case, mm. he was a, a, a transvestite, which was kind of, at that time, they said you could, cannot analyze perverse patients, but he was such a gifted patient. He was a, a late adolescent, and my supervisors, he was so fascinated by him, I said, I'll take him, take him. But of course, that was already a taboo. A breaking it to you know, to take as a first training case uh, a transvestite. But I learned a lot from him. And he had one characteristic. I, today I would say he was he had a narcissistic personality disorder. But he used to control me, the transference and everything, by writing a diary. He wrote huge material of diary. And I made my entrance to the Swiss society with this case. But then this patient came and he brought me this material, his diaries. And, um, and he said, I told him, you know, why don't you write something about him? I said, you know, I have other things now. I have a girlfriend and I want that she gets children. You are the scientist. Why don't you make something with that material? And he really meant it. And I thought, wow, that is interesting. You know, the diary must have something to do with his perception of the analytic process. I, because it was my first case, I had a lot of notes too. You know, I was very much absorbed. First cases, you know, I have read a lot. And I had to write the psychoanalytic case stories. So I made my habilitation with single cases, investigating his diary, that was one step. And then I had moved to Germany in the meantime, and uh, there was a group in Ulm who had recorded psychoanalysis at that time. And I was always fascinated as a clinician of dreams until now. Dreams are for me, we are ready to the unconscious. So I, I made uh, five aggregated single case studies investigating the changes of the dreams in the first hundred years of psychoanalysis and in the last hundred years, uh, years, hundred <laughs> sessions, oh yeah, hundred sessions of analysis. There were only five single cases, but um, I wrote two books about it and I, I got an academic degree because 
I mean, in a way that it was not only understandable and convincing for the psychoanalysts, but it tried to communicate our findings to the non-psychoanalytic academic community. Mm -hmm. And that was already finding kind of a little bit my scientific identity. I am so still passionate about it. For me, psychoanalysis is not a religion. It is a, sci a very specific, precious scientific discipline. Forse ho ampliato tantissimo la questione, anche perché penso che appunto una delle cose che mi ha colpito e ha colpito i miei colleghi nel leggere molti dei tuoi scritti è proprio l'importanza che tu dai alla ricerca clinica come core della ricerca psicoanalitica in generale e che questa parte appunto da questo atteggiamento, da questa attitudine mentale dell'analista che deve essere da ricercatore nel senso che deve essere umile, pronto a farsi sorprendere nell'accezione nell che tu ci hai appena detto. Quindi cosa ne pensi invece del fatto che oltre, appunto, oltre alla ricerca clinica siano importanti anche i cosiddetti studi di ricerca extraclinica come quelli che tu menzioni spesso nei tuoi lavori? Un secondo aspetto della ricerca. Mm -hmm. Puoi dirci qualcosa di questo, mm -hmm. dell'importanza della ricerca extraclinica? Mm -hmm. Of course, that's another big topic. But, I mean, if you look at, if you look at a Wissenschaft, uh, and the knowledge it has collected in the last hundred years, mm -hmm. I think it's, for me, it's obvious that i would say 95% of the knowledge we have collected about the unconscious functioning of the human mind is due to clinical research, which is for me a very special, very intensive, also very complex kind of investigation of the field. We call it the field research. You know, like other scientists, eth ethnopsychoanalysis or things, It's not so unique, I mean, to have an intensive field observation mm -hmm. and trying to understand what you experience. The, have a, I think for me, the good clinicians are excellent observers of clinical phenomena. And to try to conceptualize that and to kind of to bring that in connection with theories on different levels, to communicate it with others, to test it in a clinical way with the same patient in the next session, the same session in a series of sessions, or then compare what this clinical uh, observation with one patient and with other patients, perhaps of a similar group mm -hmm. of disturbances or of differences. I think that is a form of research, but of course, Peter von Erich is right, not any clinician is automatically a researcher because I would say to research belongs this, this attitude of being self-critical and to make your observation criticizable from the outside somehow, which is not so easy, even in the language. Right? We have, uh, of course, we for sometimes for non-psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis, we are talking Chinese, no? you know, we have all these psychoanalytical terms which are functional for us in order to communicate, but which are, have the danger to be so idiosyncratic that others don't understand it. So the communication is a big challenge without a very good clinical um, training and experience, you cannot be a good extra-clinical psychoanalytical researcher. I have colleagues at the university in the psychotherapy research, they don't share this opinion. They, they, we have always fight about that, you know. But I think that is a tension which is, of course, for young people very complicated, you know, to make a full analytic training, to have a family, and then not even to, to have a training in methods which are extra clinical and could help for this bridge between clinical psychoanalysis and the extra clinical world. That is difficult, but I, I think because it's difficult, you cannot say you don't need it. But 
And I, in my institute, I tried to find a little bit solution because for me it was a transgenerational thing. You know, I was as a as a as a head of this department. Of course, I was responsible to get the money for these research projects. And of course, I had the privilege, which I'm so grateful. Many of the clinicians, very very good clinicians in, in Frankfurt. They helped me to do the research. You know, they gave me their clinical competence. And then I had these young people who wanted to make their doctoral thesis, so curious for psychoanalysis, mm. but not knowing, not understanding for what psychoanalysis is. And you know, in this clinical conference we had in the depression study, I, I let the, the interns, the very young students and the doctoral students they participated in the clinical conference. Mostly they didn't say a word, but they got to know how we are discussing about this clinical material. And many of them then decided to start the psychoanalytic training. You understand that? I think you can only make these big projects, you can only make in an institutional kind of context. And we will have to discuss about that. Wallerstein's last idea was to go back to a, an idea of Sigmund Freud to make kind of research institutions outside of the universities again. But I think he had something like that in mind, because to make research uh, you, need, you need kind of the wisdom, the wisdom and the, the experience of the senior analysts, but you need also the, the people who still have time to make a doctoral thesis and are curious and open and you need also the students who m m have to qualify themselves. I don't know if you understand what I mean. It's, it's just a transgenerational endeavor. And I think that has another side effect. For me, what I experienced in my institute, you know, we were forced. The, the existence of the institute was threatened. But it had such a wonderful side effect. You know, when I started there, they were all kind of people mid-40s up to 60s, 70s. And the institute became younger and younger and younger. And now a lot of young people are there. And I think in, in our psychoanalytical societies, we need the young people. And research could be one door opener for that. But then you have to open up. And you have to kind of... Uh, stand a lot of tensions, institutionally, personally. Power structures are not good for research, you know. I, in my language, these are always the religious structures, you know. I know how it is, and you have to tell me that you believe me. That is not a research attitude. But I think some, at least when I made my training, and I was so privileged, my senior analysts, they gave us the feeling that we are welcome, that they wanted to have our curiosity. They took us very serious. Parte, credo che appunto Marianne Loisiger ci abbia aiutato a comprendere quanto sia importante anche mantenere aperte delle tensioni no? e delle polarità tra quella che appunto è il pensiero psicoanalitico e l'attitudine psicoanalitica e anche appunto l'attitudine invece più evidence-based, oppure fra generazioni diverse di analisti, così come credo che un altro punto importante, poi vediamo se c'è tempo ancora, è quello del dialogo e della tensione fra la psicoanalisi e altre discipline, quindi come le neuroscienze, la teoria dell'attaccamento. Anche lì credo che la psicoanalisi abbia bisogno di dialogare in maniera però dialettica appunto con queste discipline. Non so cosa ne pensi. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you have ever been at the conference of neuropsychoanalysis. I mean, Mark Solms is, is just such a person. He is, so, he is a passionate analyst at the Freud research, you know. But he is, of course, also um, uh, an expert in neurosciences. And he has, a, a, he is so gifted to make these bridges to other disciplines. Of course, there are a lot of epistemological problems, you know, and some people think that is too fast and too general. 
but he has one absolute uh, uh, treasure in my view. He can be so fascinating for the young generation. If you go to the neuropsychoanalysis conferences, and I have been there since 20 years, these are conferences always with young people. I mean, if you look at the field, if psychoanalysis wants to remain a creative, innovative, scientific, scientific discipline or endeavor, or also an innovative clinical practice, I think we have to be open also to what happens in other disciplines and in the world. You know? E beh, credo che davvero con quest'ultima affermazione noi possiamo concludere questo dialogo con Marianne Lloyd de Bollet perché ha toccato appunto molti punti cruciali della ricerca in psicoanalisi oggi e penso che appunto possiamo ritenerci molto onorati di averla avuta qui con noi questo pomeriggio. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie a tutti.